Uh, well, welcome everybody. Um, it's my honor to in introduce uh, Mehdi Saligan, and uh, he comes to us from the University of Michigan. Uh, he did his undergraduate degree at the Ecole Polytechnique in Grenoble, France, and uh, that was in 2009. And then uh, he moved to the University of Grenoble um, and finished his MS degree in 2011, after which he actually went to the University of Marseille but for his PhD. But actually, the way things kind of work in Europe, uh, it's very common for somebody who does research on integrated circuits and chips to actually do their PhD at ST Microelectronic Research Labs in Kroll, France. Um, and so he did basically spent most of his time there and was also split with the University of Michigan, which is now where he's at and he's leading a group. And he's very involved with Google. Uh, he's got two large programs that are uh, heavily funded. And I won't say much about it, but he, um, if you get a chance to talk to him later today, he's leading this effort in the Solid State Circuit Society um, to create this open source. You know, it's another form of um, you know, open access to chip design and fabrication. And he's worked, and Google is also involved in that, as well as several others. And he co founded a program that allows people to actually present chips very quickly at ISSCC. So today he's going to be talking to us basically about low power digital electronics and um, uh, with many other features. And I will let him take it away. All right. Uh, thanks so much for the introduction, Chris. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be here at the University of Washington. Uh, this is my first time here. So um, as Chris said, in the past four years, I've been involved in uh, efforts that uh, enable chip design. Uh, so that started with the IDEA DARPA program, where I worked on Open Road, which is an EDA uh, tool in, uh, open source EDA tool in, and also an FASOC, uh, which is a circuit and automation uh, program. Uh, that was led by uh, Professor Wenzlaff from Michigan. And then two years later, uh, Google and Skywater uh, decided to open source uh, the Skywater PDK, uh, which is uh, unheard of. And that was an enabler because we started along with other partners such as NIST uh, to rethink some of the hardware methodologies to uh, potentially revol revolutionize how chip design is done today. So the overarching theme of my presentation is about how to lower uh, chip uh, barrier and cost uh, to chip design. Uh, we have to go through a little bit of history to understand what is limiting chip industry today. Um, so let's roll back in time and go back in the 90s and let, let's look at the software. Uh, this is how it looked like. Uh, we had in-house compilers, uh, lots of incompatibilities and a lack of standardization, which actually made it uh, so that everything is always dependent. Yeah, so relics of the 90s is a common theme. Uh, yeah, so the relics of the 90s uh, is a common theme you find online on blogs, and it, which is pretty funny, and I, will, uh, I would suggest to you to go look into it. But uh, it actually addresses some of the absurd issues and decisions made back in the 90s uh, w um, um, that actually um, um, are refer referred to as relics of the 90s. So, but, but more seriously, what, uh, uh, what, what this is reminding you of. To me, definitely, it looks like IC design today. Uh, well, of course, we have much more compute power, so we can do much, uh, a lot of other things, right? But in general, the semiconductor uh, uh, companies are in-house tool, in toolings, and the tool chain lack interoperability and requires tedious effort to extend data formats. Uh, most importantly, the tools are very buggy and opaque, so it's very hard to debug what's uh, happening within your tool. Uh, so that's the situation today. As a matter of fact, I, I like to survey my students after each tape out or the new students and ask them how uh, would they describe their tape out experience and the tool chain. Um, the result isn't great, right? It's about 50% there and 30, uh, negative and 30% is neutral. The common word I hear is we're fighting the tools instead of uh, learning chip design. Uh, and that's, uh, that's actually uh, unfortunate. Because um, the new generation, uh, which is already here, already have a software mindset. Um, so they, the hardware designer we have today have a, have a lot of uh, capabilities with software, and they, they played with software since high school. So uh, what, uh, what I'm saying here is the motivation we have is um, we can't ask a student to sit for a 24-hour run, uh, a place and draft run, and then get a crash and not be able to debug it or uh, get the, uh, the IT people to reproduce the error. Uh, so this does, doesn't sound really exciting uh, to me. So as one of the major tech companies uh, where they have an army of software engineers, 
the ratio to hardware engineers is very imbalanced, uh, which is very symptomatic of the workforce, uh, U.S. workforce here, uh, and also um, it, it, you can see it in the student choices, which leans back to, leans towards uh, software uh, careers. And based on the Career Explorer website, we have about 70,000 uh, hardware designers in the U.S., which is expected to, uh, to increase by about 5% in a decade, while the, the software engineers are about 830 thousand and it is expected uh, to grow by 30 percent in the same decade. Uh, so, uh, so the idea here is to find ways of turning these software engineers is in more hardware friendly engineers. So to give you a more tangible uh, example here, uh, in the last summer, so I worked on a framework called OpenVSOC for analog auto automation and I reached out to the CS and CE department to get some of the students to help me with my framework because the circuit uh, students are not as familiar with software. So last summer, Ali uh, reached out to me. He's a 19 years old uh, computer engineering student uh, and he wanted to work on uh, some of the scripting. Uh, so that's, it started that way, but then he, uh, he was able to generate a uh, code chip notebook and he was one of the winners at ISSCC 2023. So we're talking here about a 19, student, uh, 19 years old student winning a prize at ISSCC. I, I, I don't think that's um, um, uh, a common thing. Uh, but this is basically uh, what I'm trying to do. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to g uh, give a demonstration of having more software-minded students to do hardware and software. So at companies like Google, software development is uh, within hours and deployment is, is within weeks. Um, uh, so, which means a product is available within weeks, right? While in IC design, it is well accepted to talk about months and years, uh, which, uh, which is pretty common, and we're not even talking about risks and costs. Uh, now, of course, there's a time constant to hardware due to fabrication, uh, although we can squeeze that amount of time, uh, especially with uh, mask sets uh, automation. Uh, but looking back at my comparison to software in the 90s, there is definitely room for improvement uh, of, uh, for our, uh, uh, um, uh, to our methodologies and practices in hardware. In fact, if you talk to our software colleagues or uh, the, the aging and small community of EDA uh, researchers that are still uh, around, uh, it sounds like hardware development is broken, and th that's how they feel about it. But is it, is it the case? I don't think so. Uh, I think we still can be, do, do very complicated designs which are pretty cool and awesome. But um, um, can we do better? Yes, it is time, it's, it's about time to fight, in, uh, to fight windmills and to uh, democratize cheap design. So the, the last angle here is the cost. Chips are very expensive to make. Uh, we, what we really need to understand is when we build a chip uh, from scratch, it costs a lot of money. Uh, uh, especially at the wafer level. Uh, so licensing IPs can be expensive, paying for custom designs is expensive. EDA licenses are very expensive, especially at advanced nodes, uh, and tape out masks can uh, cost from 10 to millions of dollars. Um, so there's a nice paper here at, uh, from University of Washington from uh, Professor uh, Taylor talking about uh, this non-recurring cost uh, back in 2017. Uh, but also last month at the ICCC plenary sessions, there was a talk from IMEC discussing that uh, designing 65 nanometer here uh, versus five nanometer can cost 18,000 uh, uh, more. And uh, we're talking about a half a billion dollar to design a chip at five nanometer, uh, which is kind of crippling and mind blowing for uh, research. Or, uh... So anyway, uh, in ba back in 2020 with my colleague uh, or Michael Water here, Tim Ansel from Google, we, uh, uh, we published this work at ICCAD uh, discussing uh, enable, how to enable open design. So at the time it was new in IC design, there wasn't many people to, uh, discussing it, but with the release, uh, release of the open source PDK and our work on uh, EDA tooling like OpenRoad, the stage was set to start doing some, uh, some chips, especially the digital ones. Uh, so on my side, I started working on the cor corollary of FASOC, which uh, is called now OpenFASOC and it's available on GitHub and uh, such enablement or open source enablement helped, uh, was unheard of and helped us modernize our practices, uh, um, uh, our software practices in our open FASOC framework. And I'll get to that in the presentation, but in general, co open collaboration, reuse, reproducibility of results, uh, design space exploration, but practices like CI uh, uh, in the cloud uh, was uh, dis disruptive for our framework. Um, so one way of driving the cost is automation. Uh, the, the, uh, analog automation has been uh, around or discussed since the 70s and um, there's still no solution for it. 
So what we offered in, uh, or proposed in Michigan is FASOC, which is one of the DARPA IDEA program. And I'll discuss it a little uh, later. But I made here a simple diagram uh, explaining how an analog layout works. Uh, so it's pretty simple. You start from schematic entry, uh, simulation, then you do layout, then uh, you, you fi find out that your design doesn't work, so you have to iterate and go back and do your schematic, uh, and then you go to the ver verification steps, uh, verification steps, ex extraction, simulation, and then you end up maybe with a design that doesn't work or work, uh, depending on the, um, uh, the specification. While in the digital flow uh, or grid-based flow, everything is automated or highly automated already. So, uh, so what uh, the idea is to basically take what would otherwise be a full custom analog design or a layout and shoehorn it to the cell-based digital approach we're taking, uh, which is pretty amenable to, uh, to, available, to the available logic synthesis and proprietary tools, uh, even, uh, and even be, uh, better open source tools. So uh, this framework is very similar to any digital flow and sits on top of uh, Python wrappers, uh, which calls closed EDA tools. Uh, and you've heard it uh, a few times now, we use a cell-based approach. But what is it exactly? A really simple way to understand this is we try to uh, describe the analog blocks into Verilog, uh, be it a uh, um, uh, 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 structure of Verilog or a behavior of Verilog or a combination of both. Uh, with the structure of Verilog, we plug in specific cells that are identified as the critical analog functions uh, to a generator. This could be either from traditional standard cell libraries or augmented by standard cell libraries we, uh, we create ourselves. I've added a, I've added a couple uh, circuit diagrams here that, um, that uh, basically we uh, created for our framework uh, based on legacy design that we published at ISSCC or VLSI or CICC. Uh, the, uh, these, these designs have been already uh, um, uh, proven on silicon, so we basically took this, uh, uh, this design as template for our generators. And we have here uh, SAR DCs, temp sensor, DLDOs, PLLs, uh, DC DC converters. I highlighted the auxiliary cells, uh, which are the analog functions in blue, um, and uh, they can usually be a flying cap, a switch, or a comparator, um, uh, and so on. This is what usually uh, the auxiliary cells look like. They are basically 15 transistors to 12 transistors below type of cells. And we, we uh, especially on FinFET, we make them look like standard cell because of this uh, double patterning and the structured uh, layout in, that, in such technologies. But you also try to use the align tool, which is 100% constrained uh, analog generator that we try to constrain to get these cells here with a lot of trouble, but we got it to, to, uh, to work with the work with, uh, with the help with Sachin's from the University of Minnesota. In summary, this is an overview of, of what we did in FASOC. It's a, a, um, a DARPA-funded program. It's a multi-university and uh, industry effort led by the University of Michigan and uh, in collaboration with Virginia and Michigan. Uh, FSOC specializes in autonomous SOC synthesis, there's, so there's more to it. Um, and over the course of the program, we were able to tape out a couple of chips in GF12, TSMC65 LP, which we demonstrated at the last ARI summit at uh, Salt Lake City uh, successfully, where we demonstrated a DPFS scheme with all the building blocks there. So our framework uh, was proven to be w working and demonstrated at, um, well, for DARPA. Um, so FASOC relies in, uh, on the cadre flow, which was developed by Professor Ron Dresdinski at Michigan from the CSE department, and it's, it's an abstracted layer on top of the closed tools. Um, one eye-opening feed, eye feedback we got from the DARPA reviewers and our, and our users is that, uh, sorry. So just a quick question on the previous two chips. Was, was there some sort of analog automated tool, or? Oh, oh these are all made, in, made with automated uh, analog. Automated analog. Yes. Okay. And what, what analog was on here? Um, so we have the uh, DLDOs, DC-DC converters, uh, which I'll, I'll go uh, over next, uh, in my presentation. There was a BLE, a PLL, uh, and uh, SRAMs, and temp Ah, uh, Thanks. So, uh, so one, one, one eye-opening feedback from the DARPA reviews and users is that um, if, we, if they have to use a proprietary EDA license, it's still, uh, the cost is t uh, reduction isn't significant. So uh, what is the solution then? So be, uh, being, uh, uh, with the fact that I was working on Open Road and uh, um, the, uh, as part of the DARPA program, I saw the, the potential of using such an open source uh, or uh, available uh, a tool with a available code on GitHub to create actually the right functionalities for our design. So that was actually disruptive for us because we, we made Open Road do whatever we needed 
uh, for analog design rather than use commands that are meant for digital design. And that's the um, differentiation here between closed and uh, open source. Can, can just, yeah. You said something about the was I opening that the cost didn't matter? Is that what you were saying? That no, uh, they said uh, that is the, they had to buy uh, a license, uh, so the, the cost reduction is not, isn't significant. It's still useful for abstracting the, the block itself for some of the engineers who doesn't have to build uh, the ADC itself or the PLL. But then if you still have, if you are DOD and you have to buy uh, a license, then that costs you a lot of money. If the license to the PDK, even if you're using the software, or license to what? License to the EDA tool to the software. So you need an EDA uh, software. So you're saying if you're using some automated framework that that has to feed into the EDA tool, you still have to pay for the, for the license. But you still can generate the design itself. So there's two angles of it, right? Uh, there's the complexity which you abstract, but there is also the cost which you didn't resolve really with the EDA tools. All right, thanks. Uh, okay. Um, all right. So, uh, yeah. Uh, so. Now the idea program is over. Uh, I'm working on OpenFA SOC, and it was endorsed by the Chips Alliance, uh, which, uh, where I'm chairing the analog working group with uh, uh, Rob Mains, who's the general manager. Uh, now it's funded by uh, multiple uh, industry and government agencies like Google, KLA, Fitbit, and we're also working with NIST on a nanofabrication accelerator, and I'll go over that uh, later in this presentation. Chips Alliance is the sp spun of uh, Linux Foundation is targeted to, towards hardware. And uh, we get also in-kind uh, funding to, uh, to Global Foundries, Intel Foundry Services, and Skywater. And I put a couple of my presentation at Chips Alliance Technology Update, uh, Risk Five Summit, and, uh, and uh, Open a uh, AI, uh, Open Power AI uh, workshop from IBM. All right. So uh, now I'll, I'll go a little bit on, on the trade-offs between uh, uh, on this uh, on our framework. We're using a digital flow. So that can be uh, really uh, um, scary to our analog colleagues, right? So I'll explain here how we address some of the constraints, physical design constraints. So first of all, this is a PLL, uh, or this is, uh, this is how we address the DCO. Uh, this is uh, mainly done by Professor Wensloff, but uh, we, we kind of thought about the, the, the constraint uh, together, and we, we create a Python script that places tightly all the coarse and fine cells of the DCO, which require extra attention. And then we place and route around it all the uh, decap and end caps, um, which is right into the middle of the PLL. So the, that gives, improves your uh, results tremendously compared to uh, a random placement of the DCO. Another example that I think uh, applies to a lot of uh, our blocks, like uh, the DC-DC converter or DLDO, is uh, power routing here. So if you look at the, the curves there in prepex, we have the array size versus the max load current. The curves look really smooth, uh, but then when we go in post-pex simulation, uh, you can see that uh, if we take an, a, a randomized placement or we don't put any constraint, uh, as we increase the array size, uh, we get a lot of uh, resistivity, so where there's a lot of variation uh, of the max load current, which isn't great. That's not what an LDO is meant for. Uh, and the reason for that is because of the narrow routing and the minimal via cuts that are uh, due to the uh, randomized placement. But uh, then after uh, coming up with a structured placement, uh, we put the, the switches with a Python script similar to the, uh, uh, to the DCO, and we also uh, created a, a, a larger uh, PD engine and tried to use fencing and other techniques, we started getting a better result. But now there's a problem, right? This is an automated analog generator. We are, we are supposed to uh, port our design from different technologies. So we have to make it technology agnostic. So what we started doing is parsing the technology, life, uh, techn technology left to basically uh, get all the uh, resistivity and metal layers uh, information that are required to build uh, a solid BDN or a power delivery network. So I really like this diagram here which summarizes where FASOC uh, is uh, using commercial uh, uh, tools today. Uh, so, if you, we, uh, so if we take a full custom layout which is all the way to the left with 100% complexity and we have a bunch of these uh, tools like uh, the Berkeley analog generators and compare it to Compared to the initial version of FA SOC, which, is, uh, uh, which uses minimal constraint and uh, on the right there, uh, without any custom placement or anything uh, in the placement route, then obviously the complexity goes way uh, down. However, we can, we can see that the performance uh, takes a hit uh, to uh, when we're doing high-end analog design. Now, when we swing back into the middle, 
uh, where we use partial constraint and uh, digital compensation for, uh, to address non-idealities, uh, we still reduce complexity a lot uh, and uh, compared to the full custom flows and, uh, and tools. And we gain back a lot of the performance in loosely constrained approaches, so we kind of get the uh, best of both worlds. In fact, in use... Uh, it, uh, well, basically, if you do a, a, a random uh, placement or uh, if you have to do calibration for temperature or other variability on chip, so uh, there's a lot of analog assisted, uh, digitally assisted analog, uh, and that's what I meant here. Okay. Yeah. And what about things like, so what was this for? Is this just the general case of analog? Uh, yeah, this, is, this is where um, I'm explaining here oh, some of the analog generators that actually are very uh, test case uh, uh, hard coded, right? So we can only generate one test case basically on drawing all the polygons. But now if you have to port it to a new technology, you have to take in all the DRC rules, uh, which is, is very complicated and it takes a lot of time to port it. And the idea we have is basically uh, of an analog generator is actually to be able to port it across technologies, but also across test cases very easily without having to uh, spend three or four years building the generator itself. Uh, so we're talking about months to make a generator rather than a couple of years. Um, all right. um, so here I'll be discussing uh, some of my contributions. Uh, the first one is, uh, is basically to validate the open source work we have done. Um, and this, uh, the three other uh, projects are actually funded right now over the next three years or four or, or plus. And uh, the first one is the, uh, the NIST nanofabrication accelerator, which we work with Brian Hoskins um, on uh, enabling the nanotechnology researchers and also the cryogenic CMOS. But also I'm working uh, with uh, Fitbit on the rapid prototyping for wearables. And finally, uh, the SRC funded project here uh, and the ML hardware team where we're working on a root of trust. Um, um, so I'll go, uh, uh, first I'll go over the open source ICT paths we made. Uh, so this is the first tape out, MPW1, um, with the, uh, the release of the open source PDK Skywater 130. Uh, so we wanted to demonstrate that open source tools work, uh, and also we wanted to show that uh, this whole idea of open sourcing the PDK and using uh, open tools is, uh, is possible. So what we made is we, we took the temp sensor, which was one of the block I was using at the time as a postdoc, and we generated a 64 mesh array of sensors. Um, we use a low, uh, this is the topology of the temp sensor. It's a low power uh, leakage based digital sensor uh, which you use uh, as a template for the generator, uh, basically the bay lock. And the sensing element is a ring oscillator which is running at sub-threshold and employ uh, leakage based temperature dependency uh, where the temperature is inversely proportional to the natural logarithm of the ring frequency. Uh, I've, I have published the first version uh, back in 2015 uh, as a PhD student, but we recently published on a solid state circuit uh, letter journal with Chire, uh, who, who's working with me. Uh, so we have, um, the good thing about OpenAV8SOC is we are using auxiliary cells. So we can create multiple variants of these auxiliary cells, and in this case, it's actually a two transistor, two native transistor. So it's very easy to make variants of it. And, um, uh, so if you look at design A here on the left, is in, which is in super cutoff, cutoff leakage, lower ring oscillator frequency, which trades off higher quantization, noise for low, lower power, while the, the design B uh, uh, trades off um, uh, higher power for lower quantization noise. And finally, this is the measure, measured results. This is a while, if you ever tested the temp sensor, it's, it's very tedious to, uh, to simulate and characterize. But basically, we created a Python uh, environment that uh, test all this temp sensor in parallel and get all the data so we don't spend a semester testing this chip. But basically this is all the results we're getting and it's a very powerful tool for uh, design space exploration because you can actually trade off the time, conversion time versus uh, the inaccuracy versus resolution and power. And this is very interesting to our uh, um, uh, colleagues uh, in the, uh, in the industry because they, they can actually make decisions really quickly or even if they don't want to use this sensor, they would know, they, they would have an idea of what performance they, they would get on a, a newer node. Uh, the results aren't uh, bad, actually. We have a below one degree C in accuracy, which is state of the art. Um, um, we tested in different ranges, so the temp sensor doesn't need to be from minus 20 to 120 degrees. Uh, you can have different versions of it and different temperature ranges with different uh, specifications. 
And finally, this is a comparison table uh, we have, um, uh, which actually compares to papers from JSSC, ISSCC, or CICC. That's the die photo, um, and um, and um, and this is one of the first one one of the first chip that worked in the open design. So the, all the MPW1 uh, chips. This is one of the only chips, but this one is solely using open source tools, which which was really exciting to me. Right. So then for the MPW2, yep. So. Could you remind me, what is MPWI? Oh, uh, that's MPW1, and that's the first shuttle ever using open source PDKs. Okay, it was a shuttle run, and all the chips out of it were dead except yours? Yes. Uh, the reason is, I'll go, uh, I'll explain to you. Uh, we made the own pad ring, uh, so we are kind of paranoid when it comes to design, so we have to make sure everything's working. And since I worked on open road, I knew there was a whole violation in Caravel. So I didn't feel comfortable making my array in there. So I made my own pad ring, and that's the reason why my chip is working. But the, the other reason is uh, a lot of the chips were uh, digital designs, like basically counters, uh, AES blocks, and all, which is good uh, as a first trial. But we, we tried to show that we can do with our framework here a chip that is working, but also it's not totally digital. And all the digital chips were dead. Oh, yeah, because they couldn't access it through the, the harness. Okay. <laughs> Well, we don't know if they are uh, totally dead, but uh, that's the. All right, so on uh, the second shuttle, um, we tried to step up a little bit our game. In Michigan, we make these low-power SOCs. So uh, there was this Open Titan project going on with the ML hardware team at Google, and we decided to uh, integrate uh, a system with a, a low-power system uh, with an IBEX core, which is a RISC-V core. We usually use ARM, but uh, we moved to the RISC-V cores, and we made uh, 10 uh, digital DLDOs uh, to uh, demonstrate our uh, power generator here. So this, these are the 10 DLDOs. There's nothing really uh, exciting about the circuit level uh, because this was just a demonstrator, but we, I just want to demonstrate here what is the value of using our framework. We use auxiliary cells, right? So you have this switch here that you can make different variants of it. So you can have a native transistor, a PMOS. Uh, you can also uh, make stacked uh, uh, transistors uh, you can also, we also integrated an on-chip voltage reference and we can make different versions of the comparator. And we wanted to see and debunk some of these uh, discussions, right? Like uh, some people just say, hey, this is not gonna work. Well, let's see, let's compare this on-chip and this is the reason why we made this chip here. So this was the first AMS SOC ever uh, taped out in MPW2. Uh, we integrated with uh, one of the DLDOs. The, the power routing is done manually uh, because at the time we didn't have the tools to do it. Uh, but this, uh, this is a demonstrator that is being currently uh, uh, tested by my student. And finally, we, inc we included in this MPW2 an ECO flow, which is supposed to fix hold variation to a heuristic loop within OpenRoad. Uh, so that was an enabler for a lot of people in the open source community. All right, so uh, now I'll move on to the NIST nanofabrication uh, program. Um, uh, so first of all, I'll talk about uh, uh, the background here. So NIST and Google signed the CRADA partnership, which is basically supposed to create a new supply for, of chips for researchers and tech uh, uh, startup. Uh, uh, we worked under this umbrella. Uh, I'm working on the XM, CMOS uh, circuit for meteorology uh, under uh, Dr. Brian Hoskins uh, lead, and we're basically trying to work on uh, creating test structures for different uh, things, right? The first thing is uh, cryogen uh, cryogenic model generation, so we created some very simple structures, but automated, because we want to do this not only in Skywater 130, there's a whole roadmap uh, to advanced nodes, like 90 FDSOI, uh, FDSOI and so on. And also the other part is the nanofabrication accelerator, uh, which I'll discuss um, in the next slide. This is an enabler to the, uh, our nanofabrication colleagues here uh, because they, they have multiple new devices that are very exciting and promising. So uh, the way they do it is basically using instrumentation and they try to test their, their, uh, their new device. So what we propose here is basically to a reliable monolithic integration where the CMOS circuitry is at the bottom uh, and they can, have, they can read all, get rid of a lot of uh, issues uh, so this is a concept uh, we drafted a year ago uh, manually, I just put it there. Uh, but basically here, uh, the aim of this project is to put some test apparatus on, on silicon, which will be used on the career wafer, and then the nanofab uh, engineer or researchers can actually nanofab their devices on top and characterize them and do mass characterization actually. 
So this is what it looks like uh, in a better ski, uh, or a more elaborated uh, uh, figure here. But basically, uh, this is the traditional method where they had everything outside the chip. So that came up with a lot of imitation like speed or uh, how fast you characterize your, uh, your device. Uh, what we we're doing in this uh, nanofabrication accelerator is integrating VCO, signal generators, uh, integrated amplifiers, and so on. And basically, that gets rid of 100 to 1,000. Uh, 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 you have 100 to 1,000 less parasitics, uh, and you improve your sig signal fidelity here. Uh, so th this is the idea. So, so now I'll, I'll, um, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll discuss the, some of the simple structures, and the reason why I'm doing that is be because I, want, I would like you to understand how our, our OpenAPA SOC a framework evolved over time. So these are very simple structures, right? They are very useful to create models. There's MOSCAP arrays, overlap MOSCAP arrays, line resistance, VR resistance, uh, precision resistors, right? Uh, our OpenFA SOC framework is a cell-based approach. So that doesn't fit, right? We can't make our using our cell-based approach to make a fully custom layout like the one we're seeing here. Yes, it, it works for uh, VCOs and ring oscillators. So we had this interleaved ring oscillator proposed by Nest, and they wanted to, to have, they have the specific placement. So we used our Python APIs that are integrated in, uh, in OpenRoad, and we basically uh, were able to, to generate that using open source tools, right? Uh, so we were able to generate uh, lots of these uh, 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 ring oscillators and VCOs, and um, the picture is in the, in the right there. Uh, but um, this, was, this is very enabling because we did this tape out in a month and a half, while it would have taken six months or a year for us to do this uh, type of work. So this is the, the, uh, the second version of OpenFA SOC. But then the most interesting part is uh, when you have to do much more uh, customized structures. So here we're talking about this uh, zigzag type of structures, which are VR resistance or line resistance. Also, there's a lot of meshes for MIMCAP, and that translates a lot for, uh, um, for CDAC for an ADC or uh, flying caps for uh, a DC-DC converter. So what we did is we started using GDS Factory. GDS Factory is a platform developed by uh, Google X uh, for mm -hmm. photonics, right? And uh, it helps them generate their phase arrays, and it's very interesting what they are doing. And what they want to do is actually extend this platform to be able to generate uh, uh, circuit design as well. So we, we just leveraged this platform here, and we started using their pattern scripts and environments, and we started making these uh, uh, routines or APIs that basically takes uh, mesh dimension, uh, dimension pitch, layers, or, and the P cell, which, which is the simple analog cell, and basically generate meshes for MIMCAP, Diode ca diodes, MOS caps, uh, and so on. And uh, this is very, uh, uh, this is a recursive type of uh, generation, so we can generate these arrays with pad rings and all. Uh, but the, the, what I want to highlight here is that this has been a, re a big change in our OpenFA SOC framework where we, we're not only using an, a cell-based approach, but now we're using this uh, customized layout uh, that is actually very uh, technology agnostic uh, or technology agnostic and we can port it from technology to another without having to, to create a new function or it or build it from ground up. So this is how FSOC looks today. Uh, we have integrated the GDS Factory platform. Uh, we, have, uh, we, we can read now um, a very customized design, and we, can, we included a lot of Python APIs um, um, that, uh, that enables us to do uh, a lot of this work. So now I, I want to go back to the performance versus uh, tool complexity trade-off here uh, that I, I've shown in the intro, right? Uh, we have noticed that open source tools allow much more automation. So we, can, uh, we have much more control over what we are generating. Mm -hmm. we, are also, we are also getting access to the source code so we can create features in OpenRoad or GDS Factory to actually do what, whatever we need. So actually we're pushing what, whatever uh, FASOC is to, to .o to uh, a little more to the left. And we can see that happening over time uh, since our GitHub is open, a lot of software engineers look at our, our code and propose new algorithms or new ways uh, of doing things. So that's really exciting to me, uh, and I, I can see this going forward uh, as we go over the years. So this is the resultant die. Uh, we worked with Nest, uh, Google, um, um, ADSR from Israel, and CoolCAD, and this is uh, 1,400 pads, a 400 plus transistor. Um, this is the first MPW uh, done with Nest. But over the year, actually, we did uh, three other tape outs. Oh, this is MPW5, 
We started in February. These are all together in the same year. So, and you can see from just this uh, GDS that uh, the designs are getting much more complex. So actually we use that mesh, mesh idea or Python APIs to create the PMU. So all the flying caps are sitting here with the switch cap and power switches. Uh, we also had uh, 1T1R arrays. Uh, we had VCOs with LC tanks, uh, photodiodes, and then uh, on the last tape out we had a, a, a other, uh, other blocks that uh, I'm not sure yet if I can uh, divulgate that, but one of the blocks is interesting, which is a CMOS quantum current standard. Um, this is not a common project for circuit designers, but since we have access uh, to open collaboration with NIST and physicists, uh, these researchers have suggested that it is possible to create the effects similar to a single electron transistor current source in a regular planar uh, device or transistor. So, uh, and you can do that through charge pumping on a single defect transistor, which can pro pro uh, produce a quantized temperature independent current uh, source, which we can be used as a current source. So this is a very uh, ambitious project. Uh, we still don't know if it's gonna work, but the idea here is to be able to integrate whatever apparatus um, um, uh, Jason Ryan and uh, KP Chung have developed at NIST, uh, basically on chip, and basically make it as an, uh, uh, an IP within every chip to basically uh, generate a, a constant uh, current source. Uh, so th if this works, that could be a very high impact uh, paper. One, uh, one of the advantage of, uh, um, of making this on chip is that we can uh, put a signal generator very close to the device under test, so we get rid of all, all the parasitics. It also means to, uh, we, we have a better signal uh, to noise ratio. Uh, people also suggested that such experiments uh, are done, uh, or that our research, uh, researcher from NIST are, are doing this experiment at 10 megahertz because of the uh, apparatus limitation. So we, we integrated 100 megahertz up to gigahertz uh, cl uh, clock generation on chip, which is going to help with the charge pumping of the transistor and detect the single defects on the, uh, the transistor interface. All right, so this is, this is a map of all the devices we need. It goes from enhanced parametric measures to polished instrumentation. This is a 3D view of what it looks like, uh, where people can go and build, or uh, not device uh, engineers can build their devices on top of it. Um, and uh, finally, this is a pyramid, a pyramid here that showcases what can be done and the range of applications. So al along with these physicists and collaborators from NIST and Western Digital, we are creating an open source stack with the array uh, level structures we, uh, where uh, every part is open source, from the software at the top all the way down to silicon at the bottom. Uh, and this is, can be uh, really an uh, enabler for all our research uh, on the nano electronics uh, and memory devices. All right, so the, the second part of uh, the NIST work is uh, cryo enablement and design. So one of the main applications of uh, cryo operation is to build control system to interface uh, with quantum processors. And to do so, the control needs to be sitting around one to four Kelvin. Um, one other configuration is the power. The dilution fridge uh, can has, um, has a limited uh, cooling power. So uh, if we go down to temperature, meaning our control system has only milliwatts uh, of power budget. So adding this to the, the fact that the power consumption and current levels goes, increases really high at low K, uh, we need to make power reduction techniques to make sure our control system is within that power budget. So um, first of all, uh, using the Skywater PDK uh, uh, test structures, our, uh, our colleague Dr. Akin from CoolCAD started uh, creating the models uh, in Skywater 130 at 4K. So we, start, we already have those and we started making some designs uh, uh, at this technology here. We're we also working with uh, Christian Enns uh, from EPFL um, and uh, we're working on uh, creating new uh, data measurements that are very precise to make the models available in open source much more accurate than the one uh, that the common ones or the one available at Skywater at least. <coughs> So back to the power co com consumption at cryogenic temperature. In Michigan, we do a lot of low power design. So this was a really low hanging fruit for us, right? So uh, I've, I've never worked on cryogenic temperatures, uh, but uh, we started working, we, we, NIST was interested in our PMU generator, so we made this SAR, recursive SAR DC DC converter uh, in GF12, and this is all automated. Uh, and the reason is if you do voltage scaling at that, uh, um, at that temperature, you still save, a lot, uh, you have a better energy efficiency in general. So we designed uh, this DC con converter and the auxiliary cell, which is only the cell, uh, we were able to use the bootstrap switch. And uh, the bootstrap 
uh, switch allows you to have a higher VGS, which makes it very tolerant to the temperature changes. So if you look at the conventional, uh, uh, if you look at the if you look at the conventional switch here, uh, the RDS goes up as we go down in temperature. But uh, since we have a higher VGS uh, across the, uh, the, the, the bootstrap strips, we're keeping a very, uh, very constant uh, uh, RDS. That's very useful for the DC-DC converter because you keep your efficiency high up. So, uh, this is, um, so this is how we do our sizing. We came up with some uh, um, uh, analytics uh, to basically calculate how many unit caps and unit switch we need in our uh, DC-DC converter. We created this DC-DC converter to generate a 0 0.6 volt. Um, and um, this is the number of uh, caps and uh, switches we need. Um, and this is the measured result uh, from 400 Kelvin down to 20 Kelvin. Uh, we couldn't go below 20 Kelvin because uh, the chip was big for, uh, with 400 pins or 500 or IOs and there was some current of over 20 milliwatts. So uh, our colleagues at NIST weren't able to go down below 20 Kelvin. Uh, but this is really exciting uh, to be honest because we are able to maintain above 80% efficiency on a PMU from 400 Kelvin down to 20 Kelvin. And the other part of it is that uh, we were able to generate some of the data, but also I was able to send this chip to NIST and reproduce some of these results, we, which is great. All right, so um, uh, this is the next project. Uh, this is around low power IC, which is uh, some, of the pro uh, some of the work we do in Michigan. Uh, and uh, Fitbit reached out to us uh, for, for two reasons. So the first one is because we use in open source tools, but the second reason is because our uh, uh, expertise in low power design. <coughs> So what do we do in Michigan here? Uh, we have something called Millimeter Cube, which is pretty famous there, uh, which allows us to integrate multiple layers. And these layers can be either the sensor process processing unit, the analog front end, and the PMU. I was lucky enough to work on the PMU side uh, because of the adaptive work I've worked on uh, during my PhD. And this is our system that we published at ISSC 2019 and uh, JSSCC 2022. And this is one of the best in class low power designs. The, um, uh, the specificity of this uh, project here is that the 55 nanometer is a, a deeply depleted channel which has back biasing, right? So you have to use a lot of uh, reverse biasing and uh, forward biasing to tweak or tune the VTH of all the transistors. And that requires a lot of charge pumps. So you need, we need a DC-DC converter to power up the, the, the core, but we also need charge pumps to generate uh, negative voltages uh, to do reverse and forward body biasing. So um, this is still, as I said, uh, uh, one of the best in class uh, 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 projects and it's integrated in the imaging millimeter cube. We have actually standby power of uh, uh, order of nanowatts uh, and the energy efficiency is actually 0 0.4 picojoule uh, per, uh, per cycle, which is actually pretty good, including the power management unit and everything. Um, so usually people just uh, report the core itself without uh, the peripherals. So now coming back to Fitbit, they are interested in that work, but they are interested also in rapid prototyping. So uh, this is the first project we made, which is a simple uh, lab on a chip type of idea where uh, our Fitbit uh, colleagues actually, uh, they have a biosensing engineers and uh, BAMS engineers that actually do everything on, on the bench. So uh, it's very, uh, it's very uh, time consuming and it's actually not a prototype. So what they want to do is be able to integrate everything on chip as well. And uh, this is the first harness we made for them, uh, which is actually a simple lab on a chip concept uh, with a DAC, ADC, and an op -amp. So this was taped out in December 2022. Um, and then uh, 10 days late, uh, ago, we actually taped out another version of this uh, with improved results using our generators. Um, so the timeline is pretty hectic, but uh, this is a really exciting project. First of all, because of uh, uh, funding opportunities, but also because it's bridging the gap between open source and closed tools. So Fitbit is one of the first customers here uh, using these open source tools. And the idea is basically to see how far these open source tools are, uh, are from a real product type of thing. And uh, we, this is a long-term collaboration. And um, um, I'm really excited to see how we can close those gaps and uh, include all the missing pieces in the open source community. Right, so um, this is the last project. Uh, oh, this is an SRC uh, program. 
uh, where, where I'm a copier with Professor Dan Sylvester. I'll try to go fast here. Uh, root of trust are very important. Uh, is a foundation uh, on which all secure SOCs depend. So it contains all the keys used for cryptographic uh, graphic functions and enables a secure uh, boot process. All right, so uh, Open Titan is what uh, uh, we were interested in because it's uh, open source. Most of the, uh, the stack is open source. It's transparent, auditable. The only missing pieces is the PDK. Uh, the process PDK uh, is also open source. So this is the top diagram. There's uh, many blocks inside of it. Uh, the OTBN is one of them, which stands for the big number accelerator, which is, uh, which is a processor specialized for execution of uh, security sensitive asymmetrics. So again, we, we are proposing this program to use our OpenFSOC framework to generate these IPs like the PMU and the two random number generators, and I'll get to that uh, next. Uh, we are proposing a couple countermeasures uh, to mitigate the side channel uh, attacks such as voltage domain stacking uh, and also uh, uh, power management unit with uh, power obfuscation techniques like noise injection. Uh, we also have uh, uh, security blocks like a true random number generator uh, based on a VRAM. So first of all, we, we, we made this, uh, uh, this first uh, trial of this tape out here where we stacked uh, the both domains. The bottom domains is also only lo glue logic. So basically you can scale down the voltage a lot. And then all, the top domain is actually has, uh, having macros. So we are sitting at the nominal voltage. And the reason we put in the glue logic there is the AES, which is one of the critical functions in a root of trust and you wanna obfuscate its power signature. Uh, so that's basically the idea here. We also are integrating the PMU. We are including a noise injection block, which is uh, a very novel, and uh, I'll explain it next. Uh, um, uh, the, 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 uh, the noise injector here is using coupling. So uh, the idea here is you are, you, you are using the coupling within uh, your chip basically to, uh, in, uh, to insert the noise. And you have an LSFR that basically turns it off and off the, the transistors. So basically you have a material coupling cap of about 2cc when it is turned on and uh, zero when uh, it's grounded. Uh, this is the other version of it, which is connected directly to, the, uh, to, vo to supply voltage and uh, which is um, uh, we, we, uh, uh, the voltage swing is expected to be low since there is no need uh, to shut off the transistor to save the power. Uh, so there is no ripple basically on the power line. And finally, this is the last project uh, or uh, part of this project here where we're trying to use, uh, uh, quant uh, use the, the noise of uh, building up the filament inside the VRAM uh, and during the set and reset. But there is something that the, our NIST colleague uh, uh, notice which is the quantum noise and that noise is happening within 200 picosecond. Uh, so we had to try and sample and hold it within that time, uh, time span. So the structure that there is uh, one of the proposed structures which could be novel if we are able to generate, uh, uh, measure that noise uh, to be honest. We have also done a multiple tape outs in FinFET technologies to show that this open source tool work. We did this GF12 tape out uh, using the Open Titan. It's running at 350 megahertz. This is a slow core, basically, uh, at nominal condition. We also taped out the temp sensor with a, a 0.2 degree C. Uh, we also did a tape out Intel 16 back in November. Uh, we included more uh, um, uh, uh, security features and also integrated uh, a temp sensor array. Um, and uh, th this is a temp sensor array, and the cool thing about it is that we, we are actually getting better results than the Skywater 130. And this is an end-to-end -end flow. And in FinFed, the tool chain takes about an hour to get your design out. With the open source tools, we're actually taking five minutes to get our chip. And there's different reasons why, uh, maybe complexity. So this is a summary of all the tape outs we did. Uh, we started uh, with the small tape outs here, but as we go and with the reuse and all the APIs we're creating, we are able to crank up a lot more uh, uh, chips, and, um, which, is, uh, for, uh, which is actually uh, showing that our automation here is working. <clears throat> so what is next? Um, for me, uh, one of the main projects I want to work on is data-based uh, uh, analog uh, optimization. So we are building a whole infrastructure right now to basically run everything in the cloud with thousands and hundreds of thousands of run to basically uh, try to get some, some of the uh, metrics. So basically what we need here is a database where we can store all, all these metrics and build ML um, um, uh, algorithms to basically decide whether uh, which uh, parameters is actually uh, increasing our noise or increasing our, um, increasing our ripple based on the generator. So analog design is very rich. The figures of merits are 
uh, a lot and the, compared to digital design, so there's a lot of things to learn here. <coughs> Uh, the other part of my work here is to make custom silicon easier to build at a larger scale, uh, just like software. Uh, the goal here is to have a GCC for optimizing, optimizing silicon. So this is the, the long-term vision. So there's a lot of software, obviously. So we started with Conda Packaging. Uh, there's a lot of work done with Google here to, to get this available for everyone. But basically today, if you go uh, to your machine and just run uh, Conda install, you can get all the tool chain for digital design or AMS uh, design which is great, right? Uh, the other part of it is reproducibility of result, notebooks based on, uh, uh, so uh, basically uh, disseminating knowledge through notebook, mm -hmm. and that could be stored on GitHub, people can go and look into it and learn new ideas and new circuit techniques. OpenFA SOC is mainly uh, code and documentation, so if you go to the repo, there's no circuits, it's mainly code. Uh, and uh, you can see it here, I put some statistics. Um, so that adds, uh, so that makes it an auditable and transparent uh, framework. So people can go, that's very important for industry because they can go check your code and make sure there's no anti-tempering, no malicious insertion of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of an IP or anything. We also uh, do systematic metrics extraction so we can learn more about, uh, use data to optimize our generators. We have a lot of regression tests, dashboards, and so on. Um, Analog automation is very hard. Uh, it's been discussed since the 70s, right? It requires a lot of uh, collaborative way, uh, work, uh, going from EDA, analog, RF, circuits, but also software. So um, I'm not claiming here that this is fixed. We need to work all together to get this done. And I'm, I'm really excited to get anyone who wants to uh, be involved with us and Google and other partners uh, to work uh, on this uh, project. Also, finally, um, uh, uh, University of Washington has a thriving CS department, so, and I need a lot of software. So I'm, I'm thinking here that the electrical, we need to bridge the gap between the electrical EE and CS department and get more of the students to help with these EDA tools, try to understand the hardware and see how they, we can uh, have them get their dent, uh, hand dirty with, uh, with uh, circuit design. All right, so the other thing I, I'm really interested in is shaping a new generation of hardware designers. Uh, so we do a lot of out outreach. Uh, we did, I did a lot of outreach the past year uh, to the ORA program, which is African universities, and we got some of their students to join Michigan. The other thing is the Chipitan, which is an SSCS uh, program, which we run with uh, Professor Boris Merman, and we get people from all over the, the world. So it's not visible here, but this is from all over the place. This is really great because this is a different way of doing design, and this is the new generation of hardware designers. There will be much more challenges. These people can do software. I have people from all over the place. I mean, from Chile, uh, India, uh, Egypt, uh, and uh, Morocco helping me with some of my framework. And they are really excited. They, they do GitHub pushes every week. That's really exciting to see. <clears throat> Finally, uh, the notebook code chip competition. Uh, we need to include uh, more notebooks in our uh, uh, curriculums. Uh, we did the, the first notebook competition at uh, ISSCC. I put some of the pictures here, but there was a lot of people interested in this, and it was kind of interesting at ISSCC to see these type of things. I put the, the list of the winners here. Uh, some of them are from Chile, like I said, uh, Korea, Japan, and China. <clears throat> Finally, uh, there's a coded chip uh, competition at Vidasai in Kyoto this year. Uh, the, uh, the deadline is in uh, uh, 3rd April, so I would encourage any students here or uh, uh, please uh, communicate with your students to apply and maybe they'll uh, join us at uh, Vidasai. Um, so that's how I'm ending my presentation. Thank you, everyone. Okay, questions? Uh, I'm going to go to Josh. He was slightly before you. I'm well, just curious. So it sounds like there's a culture in, this, in the industry of keeping the PDK secret and that you've, for the first time, got a PDK that's open source. Do you think, is that just a cultural leftover and could, could, could they all make their PDKs open uh, and nothing bad would happen? Or, or do you think there are legitimate reasons for them to keep them secret? Um, I think there's legitimate, uh, legitimate reasons to keep them secret, but uh, 
uh, there is a whole roadmap for open source in PDKs where we start with the Skywater 130, but I should have mentioned it, uh, Global Foundry open, uh, open source their GF 180 PDK and talking with Kartik, who's uh, part of GF, he's telling me uh, if GF 180 works, then there's a whole bunch of PDKs they want to uh, publish. There's a lot of adoptions that comes out of publishing a PDK. GF 180 wasn't, um, uh, wasn't very, um, there wasn't a lot of users. So now there's a whole bunch of community taping out in their uh, PDK and creating bug issues and improving their PDK. So um, th th that's uh, one part of it. There's also the Sky, Sky 90 FDSY, which is gonna be really cool to see because you can do much more, much more elaborated stuff, especially on the RF side. Uh, there's also the, the 180 PDK from uh, Europe, the IHP, which is by CMOS PDK, which was released like uh, last week. So they, uh, there's a whole discussion with uh, Japan as well. So we, there's a lot of things going on. Now, uh, uh, open sourcing a five nanometer is kind of impossible, but I think this type of things takes time. So uh, we'll see. It's kind of interesting. I, there's another question, but I just wanted to follow up on that. These are all older technologies, right? Of course. So the most advanced technologies, probably fair to say that those will always be kind of kept secret, particularly with this competition sure. going on now with, with, with Asia. It's a recipe. Yes. Right? Well, um, yeah. Uh, maybe for the purpose, then why is it need to keep it in secret? Like, uh, like sorry, TSMC is the only place to do three nanometers, then why they need to be secret? Well, uh, well those well, it's proprietary to their fan, right? Yeah, so, so, uh, so uh, this, you know, that's their value, right? TSMC, uh, their PDK is the value they have. So if they open source it, they don't have any value. So the only reason you open source your PDK is because your PDK is not used. Right? And that's what GF 180 did and Skywater 130 did. And they got actually a lot of adoption uh, based on some of the uh, uh, you know, rumors I'm hearing. I, I don't have any data, but that's what I'm hearing. Uh, Skywire has much more uh, customers today than uh, three years ago. So my question is about the NIST nanofabrication accelerator. Yes. That seems, sounds very interesting, but why I have never heard about it and how uh, can I access it? Right. That's, uh, that's, uh, that's not up to me, right? We did a workshop, we kind of uh, uh, tried to uh, advertise this, but this is, this is very important. We need people who want to, so uh, as a PI of this program, we have priority on whom to send our wafers, the career wafers for people to develop their chips. And then we publish our work and then it's gonna be available to everyone. But, uh, so if you're interested, we're looking for partners to join our, we have a Friday meeting uh, to basically discuss all the p potential uh, devices we could characterize and all. So I did the circuit part. I just need now a nanofabrication engineer, uh, researcher to help me uh, develop uh, or come up with a high impact uh, type of characterization. Uh, well, I mean, it, it, it's, it's kind of open source, but then uh, we, we are researchers, so we need to publish papers. We can, we can just release everything. We'll release it later on, but not now. <clears throat> Along the same lines, um, how much does something like this cost? Like, so if I wanted to, I also do nanofabrication things. If I wanted to buy a chip or tape out a similar chip. So, yeah, uh, good question. So there's two parts of it, right? So uh, after the nanofabrication uh, design is done, we, we can ship you wafers uh, after the tape out. We can ship you wafers so we can do that uh, for a really small uh, amount of money. Basically, uh, a very, uh, I, I don't know what is the number, but it's very cheap. Uh, but um, um, uh, the other thing, if you were trying to build this from scratch, you need designers, you need EDA licenses, so that sums up really easily to uh, millions of dollars, right? Uh, that was my first uh, graph, uh, basically showing the non-recurring costs and uh, recurring costs. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, so this might be a very naive question, but what exactly goes into automating analog design? Like, do you auto, is it, so as a, so obviously it's a very naive question. So yeah, do I, do you automate, uh, do you optimize the circuit topology using code or do you have to fix right. a circuit topology? Is it just a parameter sweep? Yes. Like what exactly, uh, how much of it can you load off to the computer yeah, so, the optimization? Uh, so we're right now, the current version of our automation is using a template based uh, design. So we pick a design, let's say a topology, uh, SAR EDC, pipeline EDC, 
and we just uh, generated the Verilog as a template. Then we, we try to identify some of the, 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 the functions that are going to uh, change your characteristics, right? Basically, in a, a CDAC, that's going to be the cap and the switch, right? And the comparator for noise uh, and so on, right? So you have to make, so these are the parameters that you're going to change. And then for the, the, let's go back to the switch or, or cap. You're going to calculate a unit cap, right? So you're going to make a decision whether you're going to make a five in parallel or 10 in parallel. And there's a trade-off there because when you make a really small cap, then there's a lot of parasitics. So you have to you have a trade-off there. And that's where data analysis or data-based optimization is important because you can run these thousands of experiments and make a decision based on data rather than intuition, which is what is it, to, uh, what the analog designer do today. So going back to, the, uh, to your question here, so the Verilog is automated or swept through Python. So if you take that switch, you're going to make 10, 5, 2, and that's going to give you different results. So that's the current situation uh, 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 with uh, our automation. That makes sense? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so I really like the vision of having you know, all these open source tools and figuring out ways to make the technology and the tools more accessible to students. And maybe following up on Sarah's question a little bit, how could we use that infrastructure to teach undergraduates, let's say 100 a year taping out, um, in as sort of inexpensive and efficient and useful way for their careers as possible? Yeah, so uh, there's a, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure if you, how familiar you are with the open source uh, community, but uh, Professor Taylor is uh, very involved in, in this. So, but basically, there's a bunch of universities, especially the uh, low-ranked one, who doesn't have access to, uh, to soft, EDA software uh, or the IT department to install this, uh, uh, this, uh, these tools. So all of them are actually contributing heavily to this uh, project. We can see them in our Chipeton. They join, and they want to do a chip. So in Michigan, myself, I really want this uh, young, younger student to start doing tape outs and building at least these notebooks, right? Like, let's not do the tape out first. Let's start with the notebook. And then based on the notebook idea, we can move to the tape out. And we, I don't want them to do a circuit the way it was done before. That's why I was talking about shaping the new generation. I'd like them to do it in a more software manner uh, with, by adopting these uh, uh, practices. Because right now, the students go in after grad school to uh, these big companies, they actually do in software. Uh, some of them do circuit, but they are very small, like the numbers I was showing earlier, 70,830, right? There's a need for software, so that's why the hardware designers are actually doing a lot of C++ for verification, right? Like when you do digital uh, um, UVM or uh, you know, whatever verification flow you have internally. So that's, uh, that's something that is important in our curriculum to integrate. Uh, also, open coll collaboration, that's, very, uh, that's something that is missing in hardware. People are very, um, um, they, uh, they, uh, they, they like to keep their stuff really closed, right? So, so I'm not sure if it answered your question, but. Um, yeah, kind of. I'm just I'm still not exactly sure what, what it will all look like for our undergrads to sort of go through. Maybe we can talk about it offline. Sure. We can tell you what we're currently doing, and you can tell us what we could be Definitely. doing. Definitely, sure. Big companies are like in uh, months for hardware and a week for software. And uh, you say that's because of lack of open source chip design technologies, uh -huh. but uh, in reality, the reason is probably because adding an emoji gives more profit to the company than lowering the data center latency by 5 milliseconds. There was a research done on Meta. Sure. For this. So uh, is, is that the reason why the chip design innovation is slower? Because that's not the biggest profit margin that they can gain on? Or is it because of the lack of innovation um, I, I think it's uh, more about accelerating the rate on how you do things, right? And uh, I, I agree with you, right? Uh, silicon design is very specific. There's, as I said, time constants that are very hard to, to change. Um, you know, also the expertise is not available. There's just a few people can, that can do a specific thing. So democratizing uh, our f field is going to bring up more people, right? Uh, that's basically roaring the, the, the barrier of access to chip design. So you'll have much more people doing chip design. That doesn't mean all of them are going to be expert, but we need more abstraction in the way we do chip design, meaning that I can get someone to make, take an ADC from my generator and use it. He doesn't have to, to deal with all the intricacies of, uh, 
of an ADC uh, or a chip design. So th that's basically what I meant in my presentation. Uh, I just want to add another one. Uh, like, uh, since you have worked extensively on the open source design, has any government agency or big company actually used some of your tools to actually speed up their innovation cycles because now we have um, yeah, so uh, I mentioned Fitbit, uh, so that's a big one, uh, but also KLA, uh, but ex uh, KLA is actually just exploring. They have in-house tools, they need, uh, they, it's not an IC design company, but they still make some circuits, so they need to, uh, they are interested in these open source tools, and these are actually m much more. I, I got so many startups contacting me to understand how to use these tools, and they actually started using them now. Um, Intel also have a team working on open road uh, for place and route. There's a whole team in Google working on open road at night. Um, uh, I can talk about the node, but in advanced uh, node. More questions? Oh, no. <coughs> yeah, I mean, uh, uh, so, uh, I guess uh, what I'm a little bit confused about is if uh, the certain topology still needs to be picked by the user, doesn't that impose a fundamental limit on how? much you can automate these processes away. Uh, are there some ideas by which you can be more black box or specify a cost function or objective and your algorithm? I mean, that's a good idea, right? But uh, um, what I try to explain is the way we should make a generator. So that's, uh, that's actually uh, the basis of making automation. Autom uh, like I said, an auto automation is not resolved. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's basically done ad hoc using our generators. But what we, we have a plan to improve this. Basically, by, in one generator, we, have, we can have multiple topologies. Right? So um, think about it if you, have, if, to make, uh, if you need to make a lab on a chip for uh, these guys here uh, at Fitbit. Right? So they have multiple specs. And one topology is not going to resolve that. The pipeline ADC is going to be fast. But uh, uh, another topology is going to is, 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 must have a better no, uh, SNR or SNDR. So based on that, you can actually create multiple topologies and generate that, uh, the layout based on the topologies. So the design space exploration can be wider than just one topology. The cost of making uh, a new generator is actually very cheap, right? Because you only have to make the bay lock then some of the functions basically on how to place your CDAC or uh, if you need a common centroid or your comparator, those, are very, th those things are re re reusable. And that's the key part of my framework here, right? I'm, I'm making APIs that can be reused for the nanofabrication accelerator, but also the flying caps of the DCDC converter. So then these parts that are very crucial in your block are gonna be reused rather than built from scratch, right? Like you do on a, 100% constrained uh, analog generator like uh, the Berkeley one or a line. That makes sense? <clears throat> okay, well, let's thank our speaker one more time.